I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff and, and Nicola. Uh, Jeff Cox is Associate Professor and Co-Director of CISNI at London South Bank University. He's also adjunct at Aarhus University where he is engaged on the research project, The Contemporary Condition, funded by the Danish Council for Independent Research. His most recent book is Static Programming, written with Winnie Soon, was published by Open Humanities Press in 2020, and he's currently working on a multi-authored book project about live coding for MIT Press 2022. He co-edited a special issue of IIIA and Society entitled Ways of Machine Seeing. I'm sure you've seen that. It's been just published uh, in June 21, which informs about his current work and uh, is also related to his talk. So, and indeed, Ways of Machine Seeing is uh, being further developed in collaboration with Nicola Malévé, uh, who I, I'm happy has joined as well, an artist, programmer, and data activist who has recently completed his PhD at London South Bank University as part of a collaboration with the Photographer's Gallery. In this context, he initiated the project Variations on a Glance, 2015 to 18, a series of workshops on the experimental production of computer vision. He is currently a postdoc researcher at CISNI. So I'd like to uh, welcome uh, uh, Jeff and Nicola, who uh, now have the floor and teach us to unlearn to see. Thank you very much, Tristan and other organizers. And hello to everyone that's there. We're you know, thank you very much for the invitation and we're sorry not to be there in person and sorry to miss lunch as well, of course, which I'm sure was very good in the Italian context. As the introduction made clear, there are two of us presenting and the talk will be roughly split in two parts. In the first part, I'll introduce some ideas which um, inform our ongoing work, sort of more general ideas. And, and in the second part, hand over to Nikoda, who will explain more about annotation practices and some of the experiments we're proposing. So um, I think as already clear in the, in the biographical introduction, we're, we're drawing upon here some ongoing collaborative research which we've entitled Ways of Machine Seeing. And this started in 2016, roughly, with, um, was well, part of my visit to the University of Cambridge. I was actually a, a guest of the computer lab, but also working with the digital humanities researchers there. And we organized numerous interdisciplinary events, conferences, workshops, and, as also was pointed out in the introduction, most recently edited a special issue of AI and Society, which the papers are already available online, but the actual compiled journal issue is yet to come out, but probably will come out this month. So the, the, the concern of ways of machine seeing, I mean, it says it's, it sort of says it in the title really, is, is really to explore the entanglement of machines and their ways of seeing in the light of computer vision. And central to this ongoing work has been John Berger's assertion that the relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. We might all of course broadly agree that this relation is further unsettled by developments in machine learning and computer vision. So to explore these issues, the presentation, I mean, it, it, it would try and explain itself in relation to these sources, but it also, and the reason for Nicola being here is that it draws upon his research on ImageNet. ImageNet, as we know, is a visual data set of more than 14 million images used to train AI algorithms to see. And this informs our thinking towards the development of a collaborative research project to explore in particular annotation practices and how learning algorithms establish worldviews. When I say worldview, I, I, I guess it's kind of obvious. I mean, ideology. So learning is implicated 
in terms of it being a new form of control. So as such, we're interested in the coming together of different qualities of learning in its instrumentalized social technical forms and infrastructures, whether situated in a classroom or research lab. The history of machine learning itself is of course founded on the comparison with human learning, initially comparing how books, or, or drawing upon, I should say, how books speed up human learning to the success of machines in playing games like chess or, or, or checkers, which ultimately aim to reduce or even eliminate the need for programming effort. In other words, machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Attention emerges around the tradition of labor here between programmers and machines, between the teachers and learners, you might say, and how they, you know, but, but also how machines program and are, and are being programmed together and apart. So if we did sort of reduce this to a central research question, we might ask, what does this model imply for ways of seeing? How might other ways of training elicit other ways of seeing and knowing? Again, we're making an assumption that you've seen John Burge's ways of seeing, but the book begins with this very simple statement. Seeing comes before words the child looks and recognizes before it can speak. And we take this as our starting point to elaborate on processes of learning in both humans and machines to try to better understand ways of seeing and more precisely how algorithms learn to see and how words play their part. The relationship of words to images is not straightforward for Berger. Moreover, there is a difficulty in the relation between what is seen and the names we give to the objects we see. The problem is rooted in the tendency to conflate representations with the things that they represent. For as we know from semiotics, the relationship between signifier and signified is arbitrary, and there is no apparent reason why a specific form should signify a specific meaning. The Ways of Seeing book exemplifies the point, reproducing René Magritte's treachery of objects in which images and their descriptive labels belie each other. The analogy to object recognition and computer vision is made explicit in Trevor Paglin's The Treachery of Object Recognition from 2019. Itself a homage to Magritte's Ceci n'est pas une pomme, where the original exhibition poster is overlaid with green rectangles and classification labels. The software recognizes that this is a red and green apple, even if the text says otherwise. How and what computers recognize in an image, and indeed what they misrecognize, neatly demonstrates the difficulty that underscores any seeing event and the ambiguities of meaning that derive from, from images. It's quite common to draw analogies between machine intelligence and cognitive development in humans, especially in children. Yet this can also appear problematic as Nicolas Maleve observes in the example of Fei-Fei Li describing her insight into teaching a machine to see and informing the development of internet, of ImageNet, sorry, of course. I'll read it out actually, the quote. If you consider a child's eyes as a pair of biological cameras, they take one picture every 200 milliseconds. The average time an eye movement is made. So by age three, a child would have hundreds of millions of pictures of the real world. That's a lot of training examples. So instead, on focus, instead of focusing on solely better and better algorithms, my insight was to give the algorithms the kind of training data that a child was given by experiences 
in both quantity and quality. We might say that this example presents a reductive equivalence between human and machine vision, but our interest is more about what is implied in terms of training and learning and how we might develop other models that do not simply regard lived experience as training data. And yet, we are all involved in the process of teaching machines to look at images, both overtly and covertly. Maleve describes the enormous amounts of training that takes place when we use everyday devices, such as smartphones and computers. His interest is not so much our complicity with these processes, but to ask which pedagogical, pedagogical models might be useful for analysis. In his words, how to transform it and be transformed by it. Or to formulate this in terms even closer to Fei Fei Li's, how can we think productively about the fact that a generation of humans and algorithms are learning together to look at images? The intervention is to ask to what extent machine learning and radical pedagogy might learn from each other, moving beyond the oppressive subject-object relations to something in which learners can become more active participants in their own learning. Berger looks to children for different reasons than Lee, to expose some of the ways in which seeing and knowing come together ideologically. He is drawing upon a Marxist tradition of radical pedagogy, which set out to make students aware of their oppressive conditions and to unlearn education as a form of domination. Pelle Freire's pedagogy, ped pedagogy of the oppressed, for example, highlights the contrast between educational forms that treat people as objects rather than subjects. Ivan Illich's de-schooling society is another source that attempts to counter the hegemony of formal top-down instruction and interestingly proposes the use of advanced technology to support what he calls learning webs. Added to this is what Stefano Harney and Fred Moton describe in the undercommons as the proliferation of capitalist log logistics through the management of pedagogy. For Berger, children hold worldviews that are relatively open, that is, until the training takes hold. In his words, children, until they are educated out of it and forced to accept mystifications, look at images and interpret them very directly. They connect any image directly with their own experience. In conversation with a group of children, he sees how they recognize the ambiguity of images. Uh, the, the, the example, if you remember, if you've, you've seen these TV programs, which you know, again, we're assuming you might have, there's a, a, a section where he talks to a group of children about a Caravaggio painting and they, they immediately see the, the sexual ambiguity of the central figure. And then they open up a discussion about Car Caravaggio's own sexuality. And this example and others is, you know, allows Berger to relate the experience of art to other experiences. I mean, that's a central point, of course. And he says, as though pictures were like words rather than holy relics. And that phrase, of course, is, a, is paraphrasing Walter Benjamin that he's drawing upon for this uh, first episode of the television series. And these comments are further contextualized, at least in the television program, by Berger's Brechtian reflections on the medium of television through which his ideas were made public and of course, it'd be quite easy to extend that discussion to the medium through which I am speaking now. We might move from, move from something like alienation effect here to zoomification effect, perhaps. Again, I'll read 
out a little bit from his quote. But remember that I am controlling and using for my own purposes the means of reproduction needed for these programs. Meanwhile, with this program, as with all programs, you receive the images and meanings which are arranged. I hope you will consider what I arrange, but be skeptical of it. The politics of seeing and visual culture to which Berger's essay contributes aims to make visible the underlying conditions that allow us to see how visuality is constructed and by extension, how knowledge is produced. This, however, is more and more difficult as images no longer simply represent things in the world, but are an active part of invisible visual culture that ex exhibits new forms of power. And this would be an argument, I think, for the ongoing importance of visual studies or what the group in Zurich called digital visual studies. The intensification of the visual in culture is a symptom of the wider need to manifest authority through visuality. For Nic Nicholas Mirzoff, this authority of visuality is assembled by historical processes with roots in colonialism and computer vision plays its part in an ocular centrism based as it is in a Western centric colonial mindset. The wider discussion of decolonial computing resonates with this, such as the work of Saeed Mustafa Ali, who argues that computing is founded upon and continues to embody aspects of colonialism. For example, the expansionist outreach of ubiquitous or pervasive computing, but also the broken metaphors of master and slave, or indeed parent and child, that both describe how one process exists, control over another process with, an with a dependent relationship. All these examples emphasize a politics of labeling. The suggestion is that contemporary developments within computing and related fields point to an intensification of this colonial impulse, indicative of the wider need to manifest authority and power through visuality. This is what Mirzov calls counter-visuality, of course. Image data sets confirm the problem, wherein an algorithm constructs a worldview based upon sources that entrench pre-existing prejudices. In the case of ImageNet, for instance, derived as it is largely from amateur photography in North America and the annotations of precarious crowd workers, the training data and model reflect inherent bias related to age, class, gender, race, etc. Computer vision systems learn to make judgments and decisions and as such exercise power to shape the world in their own image. But how exactly? I hope you can see that. For images to learn to see, data sets must provide visual data whose variations reflect those encountered by algorithms when they are used in production in the real world. Here, scale matters and state-of-the-art data sets use millions of images. They're also annotated. Images are labeled, tagged, and organized according to taxonomies, which make Berger's questions about the relationship between words and images a problem computer scientists have to resolve on a daily basis. The data set can be said to be the algorithm's worldview, which raises the question of what this worldview is, and more importantly, perhaps, how it can be challenged. What happens when the annotator does not conform to the implicit 
expectation of a disembodied neutral observer. If annotation is made by children, for instance, or another disenfranchised group, how does it impact what the algorithm is able to recognize and its way of making sense of the world? How might other ways of training elicit other ways of seeing and in ways that are socially transformative? When we describe machines as able to see or learn, we adopt a shorthand for calculative practices that only approximate lightly outcomes by using various probabilistic algorithms and models. What Adrian McKenzie calls an archaeology of operations, following of course Foucault's archaeology of knowledge, is an attempt to understand machine learning as a form or technique of knowledge production and as a strategy of power. His point is to understand how machine learners produce knowledge through their differences. For instance, through the ways they classify and categorize data. Recognition of this power dynamic is crucially important as the practices of machine learning operate in the broader context of cognitive work and the knowledge economy. Despite these worries though, Mackenzie is keen to point out how forms of criticality emerge from the analysis of differences, power, materiality, subjectivity, agency, and so on, and how these overlap with the cl claims of machine learning and the ways in which it produces knowledge through reconfigured human-machine relations. So as such, we ask what alternative knowledge practices might emerge that take account of, but are not reducible to the capitalist economy. In other words, it is not the point that machines should learn to see like humans, but to see differently, to unlearn to see in ways that acknowledge both are trained. Sorry, I have to make a few adjustments to my window. I can't see the corner of the of the video screen. Oh. That's better. So in summary, we perceive there to be a double pedagogical problem. The first problem is to identify the kind of skills needed to produce, design, curate, classify, and annotate data, as well as to actively question their modes of acquisition, tagging, etc. The second is to question what it means to teach a machine. What kind of learning is implemented in such an environment? How is it coded? And how can it can be contested and improved? At the moment of train at the moment of training, there seems to be a crude model of learning limited to a linear relation between stimulus, reward, and penalty, where the knowledge of the annotators is disregarded and the potential for machines to feed back in the learning process is prevented. In Paolo Freire's terms, machines are trained through the banking model of education, where the parties involved in the learning are considered blank containers where knowledge is deposited. That is why it makes sense to consider the ways in which learning is mobilized in machine seeing. Not least, more precision is required over data practices and the process of how algorithms are trained. Our focus is to delve more deeply into this act of teaching or training. And we propose to do this through a number of speculative experiments or projects that Nicola will describe in the next part of this presentation. <laughs> and that's over to you, Nicola. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing and you can share your screen. Maybe I can just say it's strange to do this in a disembodied way. You know, I can see 
uh, in one of the screens, you know, the room itself. <laughs> but, uh, Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. And, and um, I think now for, for the second part of the talk, we will um, dive in the actual circumstances of the, the process of learning. And uh, in particular, the work of uh, annotation of data sets. Um, perhaps the, 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 the most um, important thing to, um, to realize when we, we are talking about annotation and description classification of images is that this process is uh, carried out uh, at scale. This last year, we have seen an increase in data set size from a few thousands of images to millions of images. Um, to, to explain a bit how this process is carried out and how scale impacts the, the process, I will take um, the some reason I cannot click on the link. Okay, that will be a bit awkward, but we'll manage. Um, I will take the example of uh, ImageNet. And um, ImageNet, as, as Jeff has mentioned, um, is a very um, important example of, uh, of data, visual data set for computer vision research. Um, and it consists of 14 millions of images that have been clean labeled, tagged. And uh, the annotation process relies on a very specific infrastructure, which is uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Amazon Mechanical Turk um, is a um, is a platform that organizes micro work. So people who are working uh, to make the annotations, describe images, and so on and so forth, are paid a few tens, a few cents per task. And um, perhaps it's good to have uh, a clearer sense of what the task looks like. And the the, the image you have uh, uh, on the screen now. Um, is an example of, uh, of, of such tasks. So uh, the, the worker uh, receives uh, uh, a page that looks like this. Um, there are six screens like this where the, the worker has to identify uh, a series of uh, images that correspond to uh, the label, in this case, Delta. And Delta is understood as uh, the deposition of sediment carried by a river. And it has, he has to select the images that correspond to that definition of delta, um, knowing that in the same uh, interface, there are images of the, the singer delta or uh, a car model named delta. And um, to, to be able to earn uh, a minimum amount of money, the, the workers have to do that at a very fast pace because um, they have to do six screens like this to be receiving four cent. Uh, so it means that uh, by the, the framing and the apparatus in which the, the workers are engaged, there is already an assumption that this work uh, can be done in a very uh, nearly automatic manner by, by, the, by the worker, that it doesn't require thinking, and uh, that actually the, the, the attention and the interpretation mechanism is um, simply disregarded. Um, also, uh, what is important to, to understand uh, there is that um, the, the, the annotation process at scale, uh, when we talk about 14 millions of images, uh, it is only possible to, uh, to realize uh, when uh, labor is, uh, is exploited. Um, so that's the, the first, let's say that's the general um, frame that we need to, to have in mind. But the problems from there on are only 
uh, increasing. So for instance, um, the, the, the fact that um, ImageNet relies on images sourced from the web creates another source of, uh, of potential headaches. Um, so for instance, um, there is really uh, core to the, the, the idea of uh, annotation at scale, the idea that the photographs are um, representations uh, of the real world that are transparent. Uh, in the world of uh, uh, Fei Li, who's the, 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 the creator of ImageNet, uh, photographs image concept, where image is a verb, uh, which is this transparent indexical relation to, uh, to reality. Um, but what we see when we look more closely at ImageNet is, of course, that uh, there is a huge mediation layer um, happening uh, Within the, the within photography, um, and so for for instance, uh, when when we look here at three categories of fish, we can see easily how they are depicted. And for instance, uh, a hammerfish, like in the in the first row, is represented underwater. is It is represented um, through the conventions of underwater uh, photography. Uh, whereas the truth uh, just below is represented as a trophy from a, a fisherman uh, and where the lobster is represented um, as a meal, actually. Um, and here, um, it's, it's really clear that these photographs uh, do not simply provide uh, three different kinds of specimen. Uh, they also bring competing regimes of animal re representation. They're also bound to specific social practices of photography. So basically, in the world of ImageNet, um, a hammerhead fish is an object of scientific observation, a trout is a dead trophy one posts on Flickr group, and a lobster illustrates a restaurant menu, which, of course, brings in the the complex question of what an algorithm trained on these categories would do with a lobster underwater and not uh, in a restaurant settings, a trout on a plate and not on the grass, and a hammerhead fish captured as a trophy. So um, this is really talking to the, the, the lack of understanding or uh, the, the lack of will of coming to terms with the photographic mediation. Um, and uh, ironically, um, even if we can find representation of all things on Earth uh, in ImageNet, from kings to clouds to worms, there is no category for photograph itself. So um, we have identified the overall problem of scale uh, in these um, enormous data sets, um, the problem of labor, the problems of representation. And now um, I think it's time to go to uh, the problem of uh, classification proper. Um, ImageNet is based on a taxonomy called WordNet. WordNet uh, counts 175,000 uh, categories, and it is essentially uh, selected for its scale. Um, but of course, as we have seen, um, as the, the, the process of classification of interpretation of images is uh, conceived as something that is transparent, evident, automatic, uh, the kind of problems where the cultural background of annotators and the hegemony of a certain representation meet the taxonomy are overlooked. Um, an example of uh, this problem um, here is uh, that the annotators tend to accept the, image, the images that come from uh, the, the visual search they are, they are presented. Um, when they are dominant. So when certain um, 
representation dominate the uh, the results they see, they tend to um, accept them without further questioning. Uh, in the example here, the category, so that's the, an example of the category Parisian. Um, a fifth of the selected image uh, represent uh, the, the actress uh, Paris Hilton. Um, other problems of the same kind, but uh, increasingly more uh, politically uh, difficult are found in categories like Semite, uh, where uh, the, the, the visual results from uh, uh, Google searches uh, offer um, Nazi figures, right-wing politicians, and um, as they are dominating the, the, the interface that the, uh, the Amazon Mechanical Turk worker receive, um, they just select these representations as a truthful representation of semites. But the problem of the dominant and hegemonic representation coming from search engines and from the networked images online uh, are not uh, the only ones either when it comes to classification. The, the taxonomy itself, um, as the workers are not encouraged to uh, to look reflexively or critically at the, at the interface and the, the engineers do not do this work either. Um, the taxonomy itself is used uncritically and reflects uh, its own ideological choices. So for instance, WordNet flies, files, sorry, transsexual, the entry ten, transsexual below uh, anomaly, unusual person and next to aberrant zombie or ugly duckling. So in a sense, um, this brief uh, two or three image net and the annotation process that um, gives, gives rise to the, to, to the data set, um, it exemplifies Berger's assum uh, assertion as that Jeff has already um, uh, presented at the beginning of this talk, that the relation between what we see and what we know is unsettled. But this relation, she, this relation here is framed in a very particular context and scale, and that bears heavily on the training of the algorithm. Our project revisit Berger in that it doesn't frame the problem of seeing as a problem of a mere individual seeing an image, but as a complex form of mediation that involves apparatuses, circulation of images, training, pedagogy, and politics. Therefore, in the project, we situate seeing and knowing at the intersection of uh, on the one hand, the methodologies, discourse, and norms of learning inherited from the recent breed of AI, uh, also known as machine learning. The models of vision and classification um, inherited from cognitive psychology, we will talk about this a bit later. The visual culture and apparatuses imported from photo sharing platforms and search engines, and the micro, micro labor at scale provided by the annotation environment we're thinking here about um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. So what do we propose? Um, and because the problem is, of course, um, as, as we begin to see quite, uh, quite large and, and, and a hard one. Um, what we propose is to address these questions um, practically. Um, and for that, one of the ways we intend to, uh, to engage with um, the annotation of data sets and their uh, pedagogical model uh, is through a series of replay experiments. Um, and um, we defined um, annotation replay experiment as the new annotation of a popular data set in a teaching environment where students of primary and secondary schools or constituencies uh, of different of other forms 
revisit the descriptions, tags, categories, and image selection, as well as experience the workflow underlying machine vision. We identified three aspects of the training process to tackle through the replay experiments. One is naming one's world. The second is translating instructions. And the third, embodying scales. Uh, today, we will uh, only concentrate on, on the first one, but we are happy to talk about uh, the others uh, during the discussion. So um, to convey a sense of what it may mean in, in practice to, uh, to do these, um, these experiments, um, we need to say a few words of um, one data set that we will use uh, to perform these replay experiments, uh, the data set named COCO for common objects in context. Um, and this is a, a joint venture by uh, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, and uh, many other companies. Um, that, uh, and the, the data set is presented this way. It's, uh, it's it's presented as a data set created with the goal of advancing the state of the art in object recognition by placing the question of object recognition in the context of the broader question of scene understanding. This is achieved by gathering images of complex everyday scenes containing common objects in their natural context. And um, to illustrate uh, the goal and how um, this data set can be useful for computer vision. Uh, the researcher um, offer uh, the, the images that are um, shown in this slide where a series of uh, objects can be um, identified and separated from each other um, neatly. Therefore, one of the key features of COCO is the concept of context. An image doesn't represent in COCO an object in isolation. There are multiple objects identified in each photo, and the data sets the catalog of their co-occurrence. In fact, co-occurrence is, in the data set, synonymous to context. The reasoning of Lynn, Perona, and their colleagues is to create a collection of photos where objects are not displayed in front of a neutral background, but in natural surroundings. The artist Philip Schmidt, who worked on, on uh, the COCO dataset, uh, explained the process the researcher followed to acquire the, fo the, the photos. To avoid images of single objects in isolation, the authors use combinations of object categories as search terms. Considering that Flickr, the source where the images come from, already had 10 billion pictures in its database by 2015, and more than a million are uploaded every day, it is reasonable to assume that there would be a photo of almost anything. Of course, there are pictures online of the search term cat and sink. Coco contains 180 images showing both categories. And it isn't at all inconceivable that cats could be in sinks. Yet, I would argue that they generally have no business in there. Similarly, one finds umbrella and toilet rarely together, or one in the other unless the encounter is amplified, thus naturalized by the search query. This is how common objects are put in context, not primarily by any natural context in which they might appear, but explicitly by their appearance together with other dataset classes. This explains why the objects in the COCO dataset frequently seem neither common nor in context. I will, I will 
simply um, not insist again on the question of scale, but just to mention that what has been said for ImageNet finds a reflection again in what is uh, happening with a, a data set like Coco. For instance, we are talking about uh, 2.5 million labeled instances. Um, and again, an extensive uh, reliance on crowd worker plus uh, a source that exclusively draws from, uh, from Flickr. So the, the, the Flickr version of uh, vernacular photography. But perhaps where Coco um, requires even more our attention and um, relates to um, what Jeff has already commented um, earlier, um, Coco gives um, an extremely uh, great importance to the figure of the child and the child as a source of learning uh, for data sets. So these are the categories that are used uh, in COCO. Um, they are represented as symbols, as uh, you can see in the, um, in, in the higher part of the screen. And um, here is the list um, in text form of these categories. Um, and in the paper that presents the data set, um, Lynn and Perona, um, states that our data set contains photos of 91 objects types that would easily be recognizable by a four-year-old. Um, and again, we find here the importance of the figure of the, ch the, ch the child um, in the AI discourse to refer to a certain type of learning and a promise of development. It's, the, it's a certain idea of a clean start a ground zero of knowledge, the lower threshold of meaning making. Um, this project posits AI as the child having to learn from its human counterpart, the knowledgeable human. Um, in the Coco data set, particularly, it alludes to a set of reference which are, if not universal, at least common, but common to whom? Um, Schmidt, again, commenting on the COCO researcher, said they voted among themselves on the best categories and even consulted several children in ages from four to eight. What a, rep what a responsibility for a four-year-old. Soccer ball didn't make the cut, baseball bat did. What is common, of course, depends, depends on who is looking. Um, the artists and researcher, uh, Kokyo and Van de Ven, um, are, uh, state that what constitutes an object is an age-old philosophical discussion now resurfacing in machine learning practices. But what constitutes a common object and under what taxonomy to place it is clearly a cultural question. So if, if initially Coco's taxonomy has been created by asking young children to describe their surrounding to researcher and the familiar objects that populate them. The COCO dataset is an important device to grapple with the question of who is the learner modeled in a computer vision system. It shows the importance of the child as representing a level of development that coincides strongly with a form of knowledge marked by an indexical relation to the world. And that's referring quite clearly also to uh, uh, what Alan Turing was saying uh, already in the, 50, in the 50s. Um, it is best to provide the machine with the best sense organs that money can buy, and then teach it to understand and speak English. This process could follow the normal teaching of a child. Things uh, would be pointed out and named. But what are these things that can be pointed out and named? Um, this is the pervasive presence of what Eleanor Roche has named basic categories, things that are at arm's length, the this and the that, 
but whose arm, whose things, and whose surroundings uh, is the real question we must ask. So what would we do in an annotation replay experiment, given all these observations about a COCO dataset. The first thing that we would do is to create a looking group to make time to actually look at those images, because what's happening is that rarely these images have been looked at, they have been overlooked, they have been glanced at, but they have never really been observed. And uh, we could ask questions about questions of representations like what did the researchers select? We could ask the participant to browse their own media accounts on social media or their phones who make photos of their surroundings or browse their photo albums if um, they don't use social media and compare with Coco. What are their photographic image practice um, and how do they coincide with the Flickr version of amateur photography that is um, dominating um, the data set? How is their image world already in circulation? And what would it mean to collect it? So if, if, we, if we use um, social media to share images, um, how does that impact how we represent? Um, and to look at the data set and compare with their own life environment. Is it reflected in it or not? What is missing? And how a data set based on the representations of the participant could be generated? But also, how would they feel to contribute to a data set? What kind of conditions would they like to make? Um, and would they at all uh, want to participate to such a collection of data? A second exercise that um, we would like to propose is to address the, the way the, the taxonomy is created. And um, I've already mentioned Elena, Elena Roche, whose uh, theory of classification has a huge impact on, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Perona and, and Fefe Lee, um, and to take a script that she used to produce classifications and redo it with different variations. So for instance, uh, redo the classification um, with different age groups, with kids and seniors, with populations from different origins and genders, but also to, this, to do this at different speeds with more or less categories. What are the attributes of fork when you only have two seconds, when you have 10 minutes, when you have two minutes, when you think about it alone or with a group of five or 10 people, when you think about the taxonomy, um, discussing with your grandfather in his living room or asking by surprise to a random stranger on the street, With all these variations, um, we could somehow extend the range of possibilities um, that a classification could cover. Um, but we would do, we would like also to not only work on the self representation through the data set um, or simply to different speeds and rhythms, but we would also like to push the data set beyond its formal boundaries and explore it as a space of possibility. So the data set is, of course, a space that reflects cultural determinations. We've seen that uh, a lot 
uh, in the different examples, but it's also a space that exceeds them speculatively, uh, building on uh, tunnel vision that uh, the, the, the text of uh, Philippe Schmidt that I've quoted extensively uh, before, a third exercise of annotation replay would be looking for the co-occurrence of unexpected terms and imagining the world where these co-occurrences take place. What is the world where giraffe meets broccoli, where traffic lights meets dining table, where microwave meets horse, or tennis, tennis racket meets fire hydrant? So on this speculation, I would like to um, end my um, deep dive in, uh, in annotations and data sets and perhaps uh, give the floor back to, uh, to, to Jeff um, to conclude. Actually, um, Nicola, we're, we've run over time a little bit. Okay. And I think perhaps we can just end it there with these sort of speculative ideas and open up for questions or comments. You know, we've, we've obviously covered a lot, I hope it I hope it made sense to people as, a, as both an argument, but also as a proposition for, for these sets of experiments. Thank you so much, Jeff and Nicolas.